Hello, my name is Sophie. I'm a PhD student at the Karolinska Institute. And today I'm meeting Frances Arnold to ask her some questions. Congratulations, I must say, actually, first of all. Thank you. I wanted to actually start with just asking you in terms of motivation, like where do you think you get the most motivation from to do your research? It just comes. I love yeah. what I do. I, I enjoy it every day. I go in excited about seeing the people that I work with, the problems that we're working on. Yeah. I would do it for free. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think it has changed from when you were a PhD to like a postdoc and then being a PI and having your own lab of where you get that kind of joy from? Or is it the same kind of inner source somehow that magically is just there? Well, the joy comes up and down, right? Yeah, for sure. yeah. <laughs> Some days are yeah. less joyful than others, uh, but it's it gets easier as you go through your career. It does? Yeah. Well, because if you think about it, I have 20 people in my group, so I can focus on the good things that are happening, yeah. and the poor people that are struggling, their days are not very joyful, but mine are joyful yeah. because I get to focus on all the other Good thing. So I, I get to spread it out a little bit more now that I'm leading a group. But even as a graduate student, uh, you have the joy of learning, of filling your brain with completely new ideas, of listening to the best people in the world. I was at Berkeley at the yeah. time. Uh, my teachers were household names in biochemistry and engineering. So for me, that joy was just taking in all this new knowledge. So how come that you went into chemistry? And when, do you think that was, I mean, okay, today, of course, it was the right move. Now you know, right? But were you scared about it? Or is it uh... Not the least bit. I was not the least bit scared. And I'll tell you that the people who joined my laboratory, no one knows anything about <laughs> protein engineering. Yeah. I take chemists who've been synthetic organic chemists doing chemistry with the top groups, never touched a protein in their lives, never grew a bacterium other than inside their refrigerator. Yeah. I take those people and they learn something totally new. And those are the adventuresome ones. Those are the people who will change the world, right? Because they're willing to step out, often from a whole new country, doing whole new science, and if you can't do that when you're 22, when can you do it? Is that what you look for in, in people when they come joining your lab? Fearlessness. 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 Yeah. You've got to, if you're going to change the world, you've got to try really different things. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to ask you also, because the, the Nobel Prize, uh, it's awarded to whomever this year, of course, then did the most for humankind. And what aspect do you think in your science did the most for humankind? I mean, it's a, it's a great discovery, but of course also it has, from what I've understood, I'm not a chemist, right? But you can use it actually to a lot of different approaches or for a lot of different things. Look at chemistry. Chemistry makes everything we use in our daily lives. Everything in this room was made by chemistry. And in the past, chemistry hasn't been very clean. We create a lot of waste in the industry. We uh, use toxic metals that have to be mined and create pollution. I want to revolutionize the way we make chemistry and the way we do chemistry. I'd love to see all chemists replaced by bacteria. Yeah. <laughs> My chemistry <laughs> friends aren't too happy about that. But think about making all the molecules and, and chemicals and fuels and food we need from renewable resources in a clean biological process. That's a great vision. Mm. Somebody has to implement it, and those are the methods that I've developed to do that. So they're used by lots of different people in companies and uh, different research labs, and we're starting to learn how to program chemistry in DNA. But you're not scared if, if you imagine that scenario then, that bacteria would be everywhere. It's also a bit... Uh... Okay, cloning is not my strongest suit also in terms of, you know, bacteria I've been using, but it's a lot of uh, antibiotic uh, resistant genes that are used also in, in growing bacteria. 
it's not something that scares you in this utopia where you, everything is done by bacteria? <laughs> well, I, I use bacteria. You could yeah. use plants. You could use yeast. The bacteria are not the problem. These are really harmless organisms, and they're all contained in vessels. But this is chemistry that gets done in water for the price of sugar and sunlight. What's better than that? Yeah. But is this also in terms of where you think science should go, and I'm not talking necessarily about chemistry, but in a very broad sense, imagine if you got to choose now, point the finger to it, like we're going this direction, the scientific community, let's, you know, let's go this way. Where do you think we should go? Well, we clearly have to figure out how to live sustainably. Right? We're going to feed, house, clothe, and give water to 10 billion people. And we still want a planet that has some natural world in it. We have to figure out how to do that much, much more efficiently than we're doing now. Was that always the motivation for you? Always. Yeah, you had that like in the very first. I worked in the solar energy field when I was just right out of university. My first job was doing solar collectors in Brazil and then at the Solar Energy Research Institute yeah. when Carter was our president. We actually had a national goal of 20% renewable energy by the year 2000. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to create or help create the technologies that would help us transition from non-renewable resources like pumping oil out of the ground yeah. to living in a sustainable world. That's really amazing that you also knew, I mean, that you had that goal and then you really got there. It's, uh, it's very impressive. You had an idea from the beginning of what you wanted to uh, achieve in this perfect world, but I also wanted to ask you, when you started and from what the scientific community is now, what do you think has changed and what are the pros and the cons of what science was maybe when you started and what it is today? Because it's changing quite rapidly of how we do it, things. It's moving ever faster. Science, the world is changing very quickly. Science moves very quickly. The, the rate of information, I feel like I've got a, a computer in my head now yeah. doing email all, all the time. So it, we have less time to think and to ponder. Uh, I have to make time to read and to think if I want, if I value that. Yeah. And that uh, seems to me the biggest change. Maybe that's just a change in my life, though. Do you feel that you have time to think? No, it's actually for the first time because you know you do your PhD and there's a lot of experiments to be done and a lot of data to be analyzed and all of these things and and uh, now I'm writing a review article and that's actually the first time that I really feel that I get to go to work and read what other mm -hmm. people are doing and then think about it and then see you know what do I really think about how these people are doing science where is my field actually mm -hmm. because I started off with a certain amount of knowledge and then you know you work you work so much that at some point you kind of forget to to go back again and check, wait, where is my field now? You know, there's well, that's a good point. Yeah. That's a good mechanism. So I, I ask students to prepare reviews like that in order to force them to read the literature. But it's still the literature in a well-defined field. Where do you have time to read a book on philosophy yeah. or to think about something else and then see the connections, how that really, that you, you just went and studied this aspect of biochemistry for the fun of it, yeah. but then you see the connections, how it plays into your field. Yeah. We need the chance to do that, but it, it seems to get more and more difficult. Yeah, it's a lot. There's a lot of information that is kind of always drowning you, but it's, it's, a, it's a luxury problem in yes. that sense also, but it, it's, it's true that you, uh, uh, and especially this feeling of that wanting to stumble on another kind of discovery mm -hmm. And then realizing that, wait, I can, you know, I can use this in what I do, but this kind of time where you get to read things just for fun. And the other big change is a ever stronger emphasis on solving a problem now. Mm -hmm. And that's distressing to me because I'm a problem solver. I'm an engineer. I love doing practical research, but I never take on a problem that's going to be a practical solution in two years. Companies should do that. Yeah. That should be done in industry where the problem is well-defined, uh, where there's a solution that can be developed, that you have that, a good idea. Mm -hmm. Where 
in, in academic research to play is generating these new ideas, new technologies, thinking broadly that gives you some new way of thinking about a problem. And it could be uh, 10, 20 years off. But if you don't invest in that now, yeah. 20 years from now, you're, not, you're just going to have obvious, trivial solutions. No, I think it's, uh, it's very true. Do you have uh, somebody in mind that you think has this attitude? Somebody that you're looking up to and saying that, you know, this is actually uh, how one should do it? Can you give it an example of somebody that you think does this? Uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics last year. My colleagues at Caltech worked on this problem for 21 years. And there was never a guarantee that it would be successful. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah. That's just an amazing story, what they did yeah. with the LIGO project. Yeah. You have to really believe in something and work hard without much credit yeah. for a long yeah. time. Thank you so much for taking this time to sit with us today. Thank you. I just finished uh, meeting Frances Arnold. It was really lovely to meet her uh, and hearing her advice on how one should be fearless in science, but also have the patience to pursue long-term goals.